Happy New Year, everybody. Now, there is a tradition on this channel that in the first week of January, I react to space memes. Because let's face it, nobody's got enough energy this week to do anything else. So I've had Sam pick out a few space memes, chuck them on my iPad so I can blind react to them and, you know, just add any science tangents that I want to go off on while I have the little giggle to them as well. Also, as we look forward to 2024, I want to give a big shout out to Planet Wild, a global community of individuals that want to give back to nature by funding ecosystem restoration missions, like where it really matters. They have a great YouTube channel as well. So stick around until the end to hear more and get a recommendation of what to watch next. But for now, let's start with the first space meme. I'm so excited. Anyway, <laughs> 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 Why is that always the way? Like, I'm sure so many of you got telescopes or binoculars for Christmas. And yeah, that probably explains the deluge of rain we've had in the UK since then. In all seriousness, though, like, this is just frequency illusion and confirmation bias, right? Like, you're only noticing the lack of clear nights because you're actively looking for them. And every time there isn't a clear night, you're like, oh, yeah, that's my fault because I bought the telescope, which is it's just confirmation bias of your own idea, right? It's like, you know, when you learn a new word and then you start hearing it everywhere, or, you know, like you, you hear a piece of music and, and you learn what that piece of music is called, you know, like a piece of classical music sometimes, and then you start hearing it used everywhere on TV and in films. And it's not that it's being used more often than it was before. It's just now your brain is primed to pick up on it and you start recognizing it in more places. This is what frequency illusion is. And then of course, every time you do notice it, you're like, oh, it's because I've just learned it, which is just added to your confirmation bias. We have to be hyper aware of confirmation bias when we do scientific for research because if you go into a project with an idea in mind of what the outcome should be, like if you have a hypothesis that you're like, I think this is true, I think it's going to be that, then you'll start analyzing your data with that in mind and you'll just sort of confirm your hypothesis already and, and your analysis will be biased. It's why a lot of research projects do what's known as blinding. So they do the analysis blind with fake data and fake numbers until they're very happy with how the analysis is done. They're like, that's the right thing to do. And then they'll reveal the real data. They'll unblind the data so they can see what the actual result was. Like you might have heard of something called double blinding in medicine, right? Which is when neither the patient nor the doctor that's administering, like say a new drug, knows which patient has the placebo and which one has the real drug. Because if the doctor knows, then they'll analyze the data knowing, okay, this was the real drug, therefore it should do something. This was a placebo, therefore it shouldn't do something. But if they're blinded, then, you know, not only will the patient give an accurate response of their symptoms because they don't know if they've got the real one or not, but the doctor will also analyze the results properly because they don't know which drug the patients got. In astrophysics, it's a really common thing to do as well. So for example, if you're waiting for new data from a new telescope, so before the launch of JWST, for example, people were running analysis on fake data all the time in preparation for it, but also because, you know, they knew that it could do something, but they didn't want to assume that it was going to be detected, whatever it might be. So it was all done with fake data first. Cosmologists use blinding all the time when they're calculating, you know, very precise, specific parameter numbers that describe the entire universe. And if they've got new data coming in, but then also if you're trying to detect something that was first predicted in theory, like for example with gravitational waves. So famously the LIGO collaboration injected fake signals into the data stream from the detector that no one on the collaboration knew if it was fake or real or not. So they would go through all of the analysis, put in a load of effort to write all of the research paper describing this signal and then finally only at the very end would it be revealed if it was fake or not, which is a great way to ensure that, you know, you are actually detecting real signals all the time and you're not just like analyzing and interpreting like spurious signals or noise in the data as a real signal just because you want to detect something. So it's a really good way to work. But if I'd gone to all of that effort analyzing a signal and writing a whole scientific research paper and then I find out that it was fake, I would be a little bit pissed off. Anyway, let's look at the next one though, shall we? Wait, people who care about which I love this so much. I 
feel like I should have this on hand for like all the comments and emails I get that are like, why is Pluto not a planet anymore? Look, you can't just care about Pluto. You have to care about all of the dwarf planets, all right? Like, like Eris, yeah, is it heavier than Pluto? It's the most massive of the dwarf planets. Like, yes, it's smaller in diameter, but it is heavier. Of course, its orbit is way weirder than, you know, any of the eight planets in the solar system. I think it orbits at like a 45 degree angle to the plane of the solar system. And then there's poor Ceres in the asteroid belt that everybody forgets about, right? Like it was discovered back in the 1800s. I think it was first like classified as a planet when it was discovered, but then they found a lot of other things in the asteroid belt in the years following and it very quickly got downgraded to an asteroid. And you don't see anybody kicking off about Ceres getting downgraded, do you? But well, of course, when Pluto got downgraded to a dwarf planet, Ceres then got upgraded from asteroid to dwarf planets. You don't see anybody celebrating that, do you? Like, my point is, it's hypocritical to only care about Pluto. If you're gonna argue for Pluto being a planet, then you have to also argue for all the other nine dwarf planets as well. All right, you can't have it both ways, all right? You can't just argue for Pluto. And that is my rant over now, I promise. <laughs> Let's look at the next one anyway. Human setting the science. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Like, if you don't know what this is, this is one of the golden records that was sent out of the solar system on the Voyager probes, like, launched way back at the end of the 70s. They're now, like, billions of miles away, having left the solar system completely. And with it, they took this sort of, like, time capsule of Earth with these golden records that also was this, like, map of where to find Earth as well. The idea being that any intelligent civilization, any intelligent life stumbled upon it in the future, they'd know exactly what it was like and where to find us. So it was essentially this record that contained like recordings of, you know, sounds of nature on Earth, but then also like sounds of humans as well. So there was like, you know, like laughter and also music as well. But then, you know, like greetings, you know, over like 50 different languages of Earth. Of course, they also had to provide instructions for how to read all that data from the record. So most of these squiggles are, are just that, right? How to read it and that this data is like binary encoded, etc. But then you've also got this like map in the bottom left corner, which shows the sun's position relative to a number of pulsars, which are dead stars. They pulse at really specific intervals. They're kind of like the universe's clocks. And the time between pulses for pulsars is like unique to that pulsar. So that's why this map is like, is so clever. They had to write it in a, in a universal language. So they were thinking, you know, any other civilizations out there are keeping an eye on the same things we are in terms of pulsars that are very unique in terms of their pulse uh, periods and their locations. They should then be able to use that to triangulate back to where Earth is. It was a really clever way of doing it, if you think about it. And yeah, okay, it looks very complex, but it's perhaps not as complicated as you might initially think looking at it, but I mean, <laughs> I just love the fact that like the image that they've used here as well for the alien's response, this was actually spotted in the background of an image taken recently by JWST last year. Is a galaxy shaped like a question mark, right? Which is a complete cosmic coincidence, but people went absolutely mad for this when they spotted it in the background of this image and it's most likely just caused by like you know a merger of two galaxies or a flyby of two galaxies where you have these very strong gravitational forces that can stretch them into these incredible shapes but what i love about it is that it added to our sort of alphabet of galaxies that we already have thanks to the galaxy zoo citizen science project that got people to classify the shapes of galaxies and they flagged galaxies that looked like different letters of the alphabet so that we can now write messages with galaxies there's actually a really fun website where you can do this which I'll link in the video description below. It's the most fun you'll have on the internet this week and you can thank me later. <laughs> that is my favourite meme so far. That is so, so good. Although, you know, there could be some good ones coming up. So, yeah, anyway, we'll see, we'll see. Next one, anyway. Meanwhile, I'm Mars Persevere's girl. <laughs> oh, I 
fucking sad, but it's true. But I mean, I, I mean, I know it can seem that way, right? Like perseverance with its little drone ingenuity, our sort of solar system physicist's newest toys, right? Because they have all these instruments that are giving us back these brand new images and data that we've never had from the surface of Mars before. And so all of that analysis has been coming out in the past two years since it landed. Like when did it? It was launched in 2020. 20 so i think it landed in 2021 but like if you think about like when it landed like 2021 versus curiosity which landed back in 2012 like it's still operating on the surface of mars it's been there for over 12 years which is like well, like four thousand souls or something on mars it's an incredible achievement like we should give curiosity more coverage like it gives curiosity some microphones right and i think you know, we do occasionally get a science result from Curiosity. Like, I'm really intrigued at the minute by the SAM experiment on board Curiosity, which is actually detecting methane on Mars, which is really exciting because methane here on Earth has always been thought to be a biosignature because the majority of methane on Earth comes from microbial life. So it was very exciting when it was discovered on Mars. It was like, is it microbial life or is it probably the more likely explanation is that the methane is coming from plain old boring rocks on Mars. I actually covered this on my channel a few years back. If you want to check out that video, I'll, I'll link it in the video description down below. And I'm always on the lookout for new updates from the Curiosity team to report on my channel. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. And then we can, you know, maybe move some microphones from Perseverance over to Curiosity <laughs> because that makes me sad. Anyway, next one. Did you know that you can see the Great Wall of China? <laughs> oh, this is the classic, right? There's always been this myth that you can see the Great Wall of China from space, and I'm sorry, but you can't. We actually talked about this on an episode of the Supermassive podcast recently, which is the podcast that I co-host for the Royal Astronomical Society. Like, if I remember right from that episode, it was something that stems from a letter that somebody wrote in like the 18th century that said like, oh, the Great Wall of China is so big you can see it from the moon, which is just completely wrong. Like astronauts aboard the International Space Station, which is orbiting like 400 kilometers above our heads have reported not being able to see the Great Wall of China with their own eye. Like they need like binoculars or like a camera lens to be able to see it. And even then, like you need to know where specifically to look to actually then spot it. So yeah, you can only see the Great Wall of China from space if you bring a picture of it with you. So I apologize if I've just, you know, destroyed anyone's childhood illusions. <laughs> All right, I think there's one more. When I die, who sees that face? Like, why does it remind me of Mama Doctor Jones on YouTube? I hope she doesn't mind me saying that. But I mean, look at it. It's I love this. Anyway, yes, this is the sun, and when it eventually runs out of hydrogen to fuse into helium, which is what you know fuels its nuclear reactions in its core to give out you know light and heat it will eventually swell into what's known as a red giant to essentially delay the inevitable of its death and it will start fusing like helium into heavier elements. When it becomes a red giant, like we're not entirely sure how big it's gonna get, but it is expected to swell beyond the Earth's orbit completely, maybe even covering Mars as well. But essentially what we do know is that it will completely swallow Earth and incinerate all life on the planet, which it's a very cheerful thought to start 2024 with, but we don't have to worry because we don't think this is going to happen for another 5 billion years at least. We know the sun is roughly middle-aged. It's got about half of its hydrogen fuel left. Again, I've actually made a video on this before on how we actually know that. If you want to check it out, I'll link it in the video description down below. Now, I want to make more videos like that in 2024, like how we know something. So if you ever like heard me like say a number or a fact or just any time in your life, if you heard someone say something about space or astronomy that you're like, wait, 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 how do we actually know that? Then drop it in the comments down below and I will try and answer it with a video later in the year. All right, that's it for space memes for this January. This is definitely becoming a tradition now on this channel. So let me know if you want me to do this again next January. But in the meantime, if you see any more funny space memes on your travels around the internet, send them my way over on social media because that would just brighten my day. 
I'm really looking forward to, you know, all of the new astrophysics results that 2024 might bring and then covering them on this channel for you guys. I'm going to be back next week with a more sort of like hardcore science video all about one of the most distant galaxies known and the observations we've got from it from JWST. And now we still don't really know how to explain it. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on that one. But before I go... I want to give you a recommendation for what to watch next on YouTube with Planet Wild. Planet Wild is an initiative that is really close to my heart because I love getting out into wild places and hiking and enjoying nature during the day and then enjoying the dark night skies that those wild places bring at nighttime. But we have a responsibility to protect those wild places. And Planet Wild works with wildlife pioneers worldwide to bring back endangered species, clean up our oceans, and to revive forests. They go on a new mission each month to preserve nature and wildlife, and then they document it over on their YouTube channel. Now, these missions are funded by people just like you and me in the Planet Wild community. And if you join me in becoming a member, then on their app, you can actually vote for what project you want to see them do next with your membership funds. I'm also giving out one month's free subscription to the first 200 people that use the code Dr. Becky when they sign up. But if you're not in a position to pay for membership and you still want to get involved, don't worry. You can still support them by checking out the videos on their YouTube channel to learn more about their cause. I've linked their latest mission video about protecting elephants in Tanzania down in the video description below, but also right here. So your next video watch is sorted only notice the lack of clear nights because you're actively looking for them. Shush phone. In like the 18th century? Which way, I always forget with centuries, if it's like, if it's 18 something, is it the eight? No, that's the 17th century, right? Because the night, yeah.